My name is Abby. I'm deeply passionate about all things wild and have made it my mission to document many of the world's most stunning trails, be that through day hikes or multi-day long distance walking. Each route is totally unique. Some traverse exposed moorlands and rugged mountain tops, others pass through bustling market towns and historical cities. They follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries and travel through some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests accessible on foot. It's not surprising then that they attract walkers from all over the world, many seeking a challenge, others looking to break free from the monotony of everyday life and be inspired by nature. My reason for hiking though is one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. There are incredible landscapes all around us, but so few of us dare to venture into such seemingly inhospitable lands for fear of failure or becoming lost. Well, I'm here to show you otherwise and inspire you to don your walking boots and spend more time in the wild for the benefit of mental and physical health. I've realised that sometimes you don't have to do something crazy or radical to change how you feel about your life, you just have to walk. I face my own trials with mental ill health, as no doubt you'll see throughout my travels, but alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventures as I explore this beautiful planet. There will be challenges along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a brave heart and a courageous soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. Nearly 10 hours of trains later, and we are here. St Bees, the official beginning of my coast to coast walk right across the country to Robin Hood's Bay on the eastern side of the country, just shy of 200 miles. It's going to take me 11 days carrying everything I need to camp the whole way. And I'm so elated to be here on the coast at St Bees. Before heading to my campsite, I had a quick wander around the ancient village, filled with historic buildings and monuments. Many of the houses along the main street were once farms dating back to the 17th century. But perhaps the most significant site I visited was the giant red sandstone church, once part of a thriving 12th century Benedictine priory, dedicated to St Mary and Beggar. I found a statue of St Beggar made by Colin Telfer in the year 2000, in the Beckedge Garden near the railway station. Just caught sight of the sea, absolutely buzzing. This place is just so special. It has such an atmosphere of anticipation for the walk. Ah, I can't wait to get started. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, this is us. I was staying at Seacott Camping, where I pitched up and sat enjoying the last of the sun's rays excited about the adventure to come. Good morning. Today is the day that I officially set out for my coast to coast walk. It's just gone seven in the morning and I'm leaving my campsite here at some bees and then today we'll see me journey across to Ennerdale Bridge which is about 14-15 miles. It's a nice varied day so we start up on the cliffs with awesome views over the Irish Sea, hopefully we'll see some seabirds, catch some glimpses of them, and then from there we turn inland and begin the journey to the other side of the country. St Bees, the start of the coast to coast walk, and we got the sign up there saying start of the coast to coast. This is the official beginning. Thousands of people from all over the world have followed in Wayne Wright's footsteps to make this one of the most popular walking routes in the United Kingdom. Wainwright stated in his introduction that one reason he had written the book was because he wanted to encourage other people to devise their own long distance walks. You hear that people? It's time to get walking. And we've got this nice map here which shows us here, St V's Head, 
In fact, this is not a nice map. This is quite a brutal map. <laughs> and we have to walk. So today we're going to Ennerdale Bridge and then we're going to go all the way along. So here, Robin Hood's Bay in 11 days time. Hopefully we'll still be alive by then. So that's the plan. And uh, we can see over here, the tide is very much out. So <laughs> I think we've got a half a mile yomp down to the sea dip our toes in, pick up a pebble that will carry right across the country and chuck it back in on the other side. Hmm, all right, let's go. And my feet are now on sand. <laughs> oh, why is the sea so far away? <laughs> wow, look at this. <laughs> my feet are in the Irish Sea. The waves are coming towards me. Help! <laughs> and look at that view. How totally amazing is that? I'm really not awake yet. I have no synonyms for amazing. Awesome, incredible. I would just like to spend more time here, but the trail is cooling. 14 miles. Let's pack up. Let's go. <laughs> Almost forgot to get a pebble. Uh, <laughs> Which, which pebble should I choose? Um, I would like a nice round one. What about that one? Here we go, this is my pebble. I'll initiate it in this puddle. <laughs> Done. We're good to go and walk across the country. <laughs> Hi, you're a bit excited. <laughs> And just like that, we are on top of the cliff with awesome views over the beach and St. Bees. That first little climb up actually just got me thinking about the ascent and descent on the trail, which is the equivalent to climbing Mount Everest. So I'm just trying to like steal myself <laughs> for that. And you know, it really doesn't surprise me. There's some seriously undulating terrain that we're going to be walking through. Two thirds of which is actually spent in national parks. So the first national park I'm walking towards now is the Lake District, which also happened to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2017. Boom. Um, but you know, it's so important to me during this time that I stay vigilant to the things that are happening around me, to the wildlife, to the clouds, uh, to the sights and the sounds and the senses, and just really enjoy the journey. The walking presented fantastic views over St Bee's Head and the red sandstone cliffs used for the construction of many buildings in the area since the medieval times. I passed by Fleeswick Bay with its exposed and pebbled beach, then continued along the obvious path which was lined with summer wildflowers of every kind. A little further on and I reached a number of RSPB observation points, the unmistakable clamour of nesting seabirds filling the air. I could make out puffins, terns, gulls and black guillemots. Next up was the St Bees Lighthouse, standing at 102 metres above sea level. Say goodbye to the sea then. We'll see that in 10 days. We've got a sign here, one of the rare few signs on the trail. There's actually sign coast to coast. You can see we've walked three and a quarter miles from St Bees and sand width is a third or three quarters of a mile that way, so that's the next place we're headed to. Grab my guidebook, let's go. The trail followed a quiet road into the sleepy village of Sanith, and then on through field with grand views towards the Lakeland Fells ahead. Coast to coast, 2007, St Bees to Robin Hood's Bay. Just finishing walking through Moor Row, and it's quite funny because you can see Dent just ch towering above the village there. I don't know why on earth it's called Dent, it should be called Giant Bump, but never mind, <laughs> that's where we're aiming for now. I'm not convinced I'm gonna fit. Uh, <laughs> I'll just stay here then. Nope. <laughs> Oh, these gates are too tight. Okay, let's get creative here. 
So this is the last thing you need to use energy up is to have to try and climb a fence so that there you go you can close the gate ta-da <laughs> oh, honestly Ooh, what's this millennium marker it's quite cool i don't know what it's supposed to be maybe like a shooting star or something oh what i'd give to have a paddle in that right now now that would be a luxury Coast to coast, that is a good sign to see. Right there, this way. <laughs> oh, and look, yeah. a weathering stone. These are great. How to forecast the weather. If the stone is wet, it's raining. If the stone is dry like this, it's not raining. If there's a shadow on the ground, yep, it's sunny. If there's white on top, it's snowing. If you can't see the stone, it's foggy. If it's swinging, it's windy. If it's jumping up and down, there's an earthquake. If the stone is gone, there's been a tornado. So there you go. That is how the Met Office originally forecast the weather. It's not really. The time had finally come for me to tackle the long and steady climb up to the top of Dent Hill. First through the shady Black Cow Woods and then out across the open moorland. Here we are then, the top of Dent, 353 metres above sea level. And, uh, oh, <laughs> so we got epic views over there, over the Irish Sea, and then over the brow here, we've got the Lakeland Fells peeking out. <sighs> Gosh, you really can see a long way. Anyway, boom, top of Dent. Highest point for today. Very, very glad to be here. <laughs> I really can't get enough of it up here. It's just spectacular. And, and the views over towards the Lakeland Fells that are just domineering, or completely blocking actually, the horizon. I just can't wait to be in amongst those peaks. It's funny because the path just literally disappears over the edge and you can't see down until you're like stood right on it. <laughs> nope, still can't see down. I've just had a slip, which is not a problem, but I just slid all the way from that notch all the way down here, which actually gives me an idea. Maybe I should just try and slide this because the grass is so dry. <laughs> 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 I don't want to go that way. I want to go this way. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I brought this load of squares bars that were made by my awesome friend. But what we didn't realize is that they're hot or we're in a hot place and when they get hot they squidge together so this my friends is a giant squares bar and I can eat it like this it's very satisfying <laughs> I'm not sure which way to go now oh look a big sign that way let's go <laughs> Steady. Oh, here comes the car. We're supposed to stay on this path here, on the side of the road, to Ennerdale Bridge, one and a quarter miles. Fab stuff. And now we won't get run over because we're on this path and not on the road. <laughs> oh, shady too. That's ideal. I abandoned hope with that path. It was getting a bit overgrown and bit gnarly so I'm on the road now and it's amazing the difference in temperature between being in a hedge and on tarmac. Feeling the heat. Welcome to Ennerdale Bridge. Please drive carefully. No worries. <laughs> Entering into the village I had a look around the gatherer, a bespoke centre launched in 2016 
with a cafe, a shop selling local produce, and community rooms hosting well-being events and workshops. Here we are then at the pub Fox and Hounds, which is where I'm staying tonight, just camping around the back. Today has been a good day. Lots of stop starting, which is fine because it means I've been able to rest and sort of break into the trail nice and gently. So I'm feeling satisfied. I just want to get my tent up now and then hopefully we can get a brew on. <laughs> For five pounds, I pitched my tents around the back of the pub on some scrubby land and then went to cool off and chill out by paddling in the River Ian. It had been a good first day on the trail. Good morning, we are on the trail, 15 miles today from here, Ennerdale Bridge, all the way to Stonethwaite in Borodale. I have decided I'm going to stay low, so I'm going to walk up uh, through Ennerdale Forest as opposed to go up to High Pike and High Spy and basically the Buttermere Fells. But the sun is shining, I'm feeling good on the inside and the outside. Let's get some miles in. First up, Ennerdale Water. Welcome to Ennerdale, Ennerdale Lake, one mile. This way. I've just taken my pack off for a little rest with awesome views here over Ennerdale water. It is so, so still and the most precious day here in the Lake District. You know, it's interesting because this whole area is actually a triple SI, so it's a site of special scientific interest. And you wouldn't really believe that given the industrial processes we've just passed owned by United Utilities, but the water here actually serves 80,000 people further down the down, downstream uh, at Whitehaven, which we kind of passed, we saw some sites over yesterday. And um, it's actually due to be decommissioned as a reservoir in 2022. So we'll see what really happens then, because these guys, you know, they keep this water clean, they maintain the shoreline and they keep it safe and accessible. So it will have a real like shift period or a transition period in a couple of years but for now we're just going to enjoy this incredible view and the path that we take then today is just going to follow the shoreline and I say just follow the shoreline we've got a couple of scrambles including Robin Hood chair as it's named <laughs> Got this rocky section, all fun and games. I made it over Angler's Crag and Robin Hood's chair with ease, though I felt uneasy as I walked. Despite the beauty around me, I found I was struggling to manage my headspace. I felt lost in the darkness and swirling voices that were trying to consume me, and panic rose in my chest, which grew tighter with every step. The pain in my back from an old injury became magnified, and before long, I could hardly keep moving forwards drowning in doubts and insecurities. I think just all of the fatigue that all of the fatigue that was there before kind of coming out here is finally coming to the surface, which is a good thing in a way. It means I can get it out. I get lost in like, why do I have to do this sort of stuff? Like I do it because I want to do it and I enjoy it. But what happens when you don't enjoy it? Then I'm like, well, why am I here? <laughs> and I, I'm here because, you know, I struggle with mental health a lot. <laughs> and it does my head in sometimes. Oh, struggling with mental health it takes the joy out of so many things and basically that's what's going on now is because I'm tired my head's just in a bit of turmoil and I've not got the mental resilience to catch that so my body can just keep on moving which is great and I can kind of just tell my back pain to shut up but I don't want to do that like I want to thrive this is where I thrive you know, I'm just, I want to push through today and um, just try and process some of this emotion a bit. I think that'll be the healthy thing to do. Anyway, I've stopped again, <laughs> which is fine. A little bit of emotion, that's all good, except it's not, I'm wasting water, don't cry.
So the point with the mental health stuff then is that, yes, I struggle with mental health. It's frustrating. It's a challenge every single day. Um, but, you know, I really want to do this walk, first of all, to show myself that I can, but also to show other people who struggle with mental and physical illness that they can. Just, it's about your journey and embracing your journey. And so for me, if my journey's dynamic, if I need to change some days, I'll change some days because I need to make this work because I need to finish this walk. And I really want to encourage anyone watching this to, you know, potentially take up a challenge that they've been putting off and putting off to give it a shot, but be kind to yourself in the process. And I'm pretty sure when you've done it, when you've succeeded, you'll come out the other end a whole lot stronger. Eventually, after much stopping and starting, I made it to the end of the lake, joining a track into Ennerdale Forest. I popped into the Ennerdale Youth Hostel to check out the facilities and dream up future trips, its airy common room boasting unbelievable views and a real feeling of peace and tranquility. I knew I'd be coming back soon. Pressing on, I could hear the River Lisa roaring alongside, but couldn't quite see it, so decided to divert off route slightly and get a better view. Wow! Oh my word, look at that! Oh man, we've made it. Black Sail Hut, England's most remote youth hostel here in the Ennerdale Valley. Oh man, what an amazing, amazing location. Girlie, the door's that way. That's it, that's it, that's it. No, 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 no. Go on, then, that's it. No, well, that's obvious. That's, there you go, she's gone. Happy days. Oh, bless her. That was a bit sad. This is actually a really special place, and it was one of Wainwright's favourite places to actually come and rest and break up his walk, and you can really see why. Inside itself is full of character, and obviously it's been adapted to the present times, but it's got a lot of sort of throwback to history pictures and and maps um, and then outside you just walk out and you're just bombarded with the most epic view of all the mountains and the river and the forests it really is just a slice of heaven I just kind of marched up those four miles and it was a challenge and I'm glad to be here because it feels like a milestone for the day just like yesterday getting to the top of Dent this landscape just can't get over it and of course up here is the high route that we could have taken today. So it goes over Red Pike all the way along to Haystacks, which we'll get to see when we go up Loft Beck. But just growing in anticipation for this climb up to the top, because it really is a climb, but I'm looking forward to it as well. It's just amazing to be able to walk through a landscape that's been sculpted by glaciers over tens of thousands of years. And everything here is so vast and deep and ginormous. Whatever synonyms you want, it's huge. Oh, I feel truly humbled to be able to be walking here. I'm feeling refreshed, energised and game to go. This is the Abbey I know on the trail, not that one back there. <laughs> So this is Loft Beck itself, coming down all the way from the top there. And this is not dried out, which is nice to see. Fishy feeling hot, but still really enjoying this. This is definitely my kind of thing. Getting the heart rate up, weaving your way through the rocks to get to the top, which gets closer with every step. And you look back and we get to enjoy that. Ah, oh, this is epic. Wow. Oh my word. That is incredible. <laughs> Woo. 
Yes! We made it to the top of Lovebeck and that is our reward. Oh yeah. I was looking down over Buttermere and Crummock Water, the shores along which I'd enjoyed many past adventures. Ahead was Fleetworth Pike, its flanks scarred with slate quarries, an industry that began in 1728 on an industrial scale and continued until the mid-1900s. The route then followed a disused tramway down to Honester Slate Mine and Visitor Centre, home to the last working slate mine in England. You can watch the slate being split and prepared, explore their shop, take tours of the mines, and enjoy homemade food and cakes at their cafe. That's one cinnamon roll for me, please. Just passing through Sea Twaller, so we're making progress now into the Borrowdale Valley. This is one of the most beautiful valleys in the Lake District, but I've just got something to show you if I can do this without getting run over. Look at the tarmac. It's literally melting. It's really sticky and uh, sticks to the bottom of my boots, which is, which is interesting. But anyway, we're just going to keep making progress. So up next is Longthwaite, then Rothwaite and then Stonethwaite. This woodland that I'm walking through now is actually called Johnny Woods and it's part of the Atlantic Oak Woods here on the way to Longthwaite. Now what's really interesting is it's actually correctly known as a temperate rainforest and that's because the moist Atlantic air that's normally filling this valley allows lichen and mosses to cover the, the stones, the boulders, the trees, the oaks and normally they're just dripping and it's a very wet environment. So. Uh, it's just really great to be able to pass through here and know that, in theory, I'm in a rainforest. <laughs> Metal wire, if needed. I can imagine this gets really slippy, actually, in the winter after rain it rains. It's literally half a mile now to the campsite. Feeling all right, but my body's getting a bit tired. I haven't stopped since Honister. Uh, quite looking forward to getting my tent up. It's actually wet from last night, all the condensation. So we'll get that dried out and then crash. And I have to say, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Stonethwaite Farm campsite sat within a series of fields alongside Stonethwaite Beck, an idyllic spot to rest and relax after a long day's walk on the coast to coast. Good morning! It is day three on the coast to coast and I'm still alive. Well, I really doubted my existence with all the midges that were attacking my face this morning. Nevertheless, I'm on the trail. So today, two halves, first half up over Green Up Edge Pass and then the second half is up to Grisdale Town, over the top, down into Patterdale. So it's about 17, 18 miles. We'll just take it steady. Here comes the sun. Oh, that's glorious. <laughs> it felt really good to start the day with a long climb and there were impressive views back down over Borrowdale behind me. Ahead though was a landscape filled with glacial moraines, mounds of sediment collected and deposited by moving ice during the last ice age around 10,000 years ago. That beach behind me is Lining Crag. That's where we want to climb up to. So we're going to forge our way up through this sort of gully and just work our way up to the top. It's kind of a loft back all over again. But I'm really enjoying this landscape. It really does feel like something out of Lord of the Rings. I feel quite at home here. And if the orcs dare come, dare they battle me. <laughs> It was a steep slog to the top of Lining Crag at 542 metres above sea level, but once again my breath was stolen by the landscape that opened out around me, an endless horizon of peaks and summits, including Scarfell Pike to the west and Skiddle to the north. Once rested, it was on over Grasmere Common, following an indistinct trail, and then down into Far Easdale Valley, where the path once again became more obvious, crossing small streams and becks as it went. 
It really is so beautiful down here. We're just working our way along the valley before we drop down towards Grasmere. You just can't rush this kind of place. <laughs> Maisie's homemade flapjack. <laughs> the trail turned off before Grasmere, but I headed into the village to treat myself to a proper lunch. It was a busy place, so I quickly ate, charged my phone, and then rejoined the trail, passing the Thorny Howe Independent Hostel on the way. Crossing there, A591. Probably gonna get run over. <laughs> and so begins the ascent up to Grisdale Tarn. So I'm at the convergence point between Little Tongue Gill, which is this little piece of water, and if I hurry over here, there's Tongue Gill. So there's various options which way I could go up to the Tarn, so I can take the Little Tongue Gill way, which is a bit steeper, or the Tongue Gill way, which is the way I'm going to go. Love that sound. The path up Tungil was mostly slabbed to help prevent erosion due to heavy footfall, and I stuck to its boundaries as carefully as I could, crossing countless streams and stopping often to wet my face and enjoy the views behind. <sighs> Starting to feel a bit tired now. I think the heat's really getting to me. I'm feeling sick. Uh, I think it's partly because I ate stuff down at Grasmere. I don't normally eat much at lunchtime. Uh, I got this bit of a breeze now, which is really nice, but it's just so hot. It's nauseating. Yes, there it is. Grisdale Tarn. Oh, thank goodness for that. Whew. Oh, has a good sight. I sat and rested for a while by the tarn, relaxing into the stillness of the place, and being thoroughly entertained by small fish swimming in the shallows. Whoa, there's loads of fish. <laughs> The main trail headed down from the tarn into Grisdale Valley. There was the option to go high over St Sunday Crag, but I didn't really feel well enough. Instead, I chose to embrace the beauty of the traditional route alongside Grisdale Beck. Rothweet Lodge. Oh, cool. So, uh, this is a climbing hut for climbers, of which I am not one, so it's locked to me. Never mind. <laughs> wow, <laughs> look at this. Wonderful. Hey cowies. You guys are very clean and shiny. Have you been shampooing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One last view up the valley. Pretty spectacular. It's been awesome walking today. You know, I stopped quite a few times just to listen on the way down and I could really hear nothing. And that's one of my favorite things on this earth is when you can truly escape the sound of technology and unnatural noise. It just really speaks to my soul. And I really felt like the mountains and the landscape was just saying, embrace the journey. Like, don't panic. Uh, I just, I'm really surprised at how thrown I felt these last couple of days at all the decisions and things I've had to make uh, and how hard I found them. Right the way from day one, challenges have been thrown my way. And actually, you know, when I can gather my thoughts enough, it's really a good thing. And I'm quite excited to see what this journey is going to do to forge me 
into a better version of myself. It didn't take very long to explore Patterdale, mostly comprised of the 19th century White Lion pub and a village store and post office that was the first place to sell copies of Wainwright's guidebooks and had been running for nearly a hundred years. That is a pretty beautiful view. Last quarter of a mile down this track to the campsite, which would be lovely to walk through in the morning. And we got views here over Owls Water, one of the most popular lakes in the Lake District, just glistening in the sun. I was staying at Side Farm Campsite, which was busy with campers, but I managed to escape to the shores of Owls Water for some space and reflection time. It was a heavenly spot that left me feeling refreshed and ready for the next day's adventure. Today is the day that we leave the Lake District National Park. We got 16 miles today that's taking us over to Shap and I'm just walking from the campsite now to pick up the original trail where I left it last night. Here we are, Angle Tarn and Boradale House. This is the way we're gonna go. What a blessing it is to be able to be here right now. I mean, the whole landscape is just lit up in this beautiful gold color. It's like the Lake District is waving goodbye for our final stage within its boundaries today. Oh, I feel so humbled. With the golden morning light shining all around, Angle Tarn was one of the most peaceful and picturesque places I've passed by on the trail so far. I was mesmerised by its gently rippling waters and wild surroundings, and there were a few lucky campers packing up, getting ready to begin their day. How I wish I'd camped there too. Next time, I told myself. What do you think? Gateway to heaven? I think so. Oh my word, this is just mind-blowing. How could, how could I express this emotion? So we've got views down here over Hayeswater, which is this tarn tucked away in this bowl of a valley. And then to my left here, we've got Rest Dodd, which is the peak that we just skirt around. And then I can see the path heading up to the knot, which is where we're aiming for. This landscape, oh my word, is <laughs> just beyond, beyond words. It was on the ascent up to the knot at 739 metres above sea level that I spotted a number of herds of deer feeding on the moors around me. They were quite far away, but felt like a real treat that left me bearing a giant grin for the rest of the morning. So that there is the summit of the knot. The path is actually skirted around and uh, we're just hand railing or following this wall for a little bit. I was feeling over hot and quite unfocused as I made my way on along the broad and obvious track up to the summit of Kidsty Pike. It was only after much huffing and puffing as the trail began to level out that I realised I'd made a major schoolboy error. I've come up the wrong peak, haven't I? So this is High Street. I thought I recognised it. I was like, no, this is not the right way. So basically over there is where I'm supposed to be. At the split, I should have gone left rather than straight on up here. So, uh, fine, I've just come up the wrong mountain. I can't believe I've done that. Like, that's just the most ridiculous thing. Oh well. <laughs> Embrace the journey. <sighs> oh, right, I'm having a banana. I need a morale boost. Just looking at the map and I can see where I went wrong now. Basically, I love this name. I just continued to follow the Straits of Rigandale, which has brought me up High Street. <coughs> and what I'm gonna do is in a spirit of goodwill to myself, as I'm just gonna run up there and I'm gonna touch the top so then I can say, I've done High Street, which was totally unintentional, but fine. Boom. I could totally pretend I wanted to be here, but that would ruin the authenticity of this film. It was a complete mistake, but I'm owning it. And 
luckily the weather's fine and I just get an extra summit in so <laughs> woo, here we are high street it really is like a high street believe it or not it's just one big flat grassy mound that actually it stretches out quite far either side so you can only just see the tops of the mountains around us now I've just got to locate my pack which I left somewhere along this wall <laughs> oops probably should have found a marker thankfully I won't be able to walk past it but then again I've just walked up the wrong mountain so you know anything goes <laughs> okay let's try the next mountain shall we my mistake didn't really phase me as instead I chose to focus on the lessons I could learn and be thankful for the clear weather that had allowed me to easily relocate myself before long, I'd rejoined the official trail and was standing on the real summit of Kidsty Pike, the highest point of the official route at 784 metres above sea level. I stopped there for a fair while to survey the mountain heartlands around me and imagined what it would have been like to explore the area thousands of years ago when the land was still truly wild. Oh my gosh, this is steep. <laughs> What kind of a descent is that? It may as well just go straight down. <laughs> what? It's crazy. So the path kind of like zigzags down, but basically it then just like drops down. It just gives up. It's like, nope, we're going down. Oh man, we made it to the bottom. And check this out. Hawes Water became one of Cumbria's largest bodies of water after a 35 metre high dam was built in 1929. The creation of the reservoir swallowed several settlements, such as Mardale Green, but I wasn't so much focused on the water since I was feeling the beginnings of heat stroke in the 30 degree temperatures. So instead, I put everything into just keeping moving forwards along the undulating path which passed in a blur of flowers, ferns, streams and fences. It was tough going, but I was never going to quit. That was some seriously hard walking. Probably some of the most painful miles I have done backpacking in a long time. I am pleased to say that in my very dazed state walking that last stretch, I did manage to pick up another stick. This is a piece of pine. It's certainly heavier than the other piece of wood I had, uh, which I still have at the moment. It's just about long enough to use and I kind of got attached to it. Um, but I'm just smoothing out the handle here and I, what's quite cool is I'm going to take all the bark off this and I'm going to sort of whittle it as I go, perhaps with, with signs and things that I find on the journey. So. Um, I just can't bring myself to get rid of this piece of stick that has seen me up over Grisdale Town. <laughs> Never mind, it's a process, you know. We'll work things out. C to C. Picking up the signs again. These woodlands are so picturesque. I really enjoy walking through them. It's such a mixture of oak and beech and silver birch and hazel. I reckon it's got to be ancient woodland. Oh. Oh. Thomas's honesty box, drinks and snacks. Oh, now we're talking. Yes. This is what we call a trail angel. Someone that leaves stuff on the trail so that we can have refreshments thank you thomas <laughs> for a short while i followed the blissful horsewater beck over which were a number of old pack horse bridges likely dating back to the early 18th century over the style gotta love these things Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> complete with sound effects Ooh, there's a tree Help. The 
the last views of the Lake District National Park behind me and I'm pressing on away from its boundaries. My heart is filled with sorrow. Lake District, you stole my heart years ago, but I will be back. On to the Pennines we push, through fields of meadows, flowers, butterflies and bees. <sighs> Breathe, on to the next leg of the journey. On to Yorkshire. Shap Abbey sits alongside the River Lofer and was the last abbey to be founded in England in 1199. Its life came to an end in 1540 during the dissolution of the monasteries when the buildings were gradually dismantled and materials reused. The impressive 15th century western bell tower still remains however and the site is an unbelievably peaceful place to explore. Just a couple hundred metres and I'll be at New Ing Lodge, which is where I'm staying tonight. It has been a long day and I've successfully added on many miles. Uh, what you didn't see because I didn't film it is I dropped my guidebook and I had to walk back a mile and a half. Uh, I was on the phone and I didn't notice that I dropped it. So that's added on at least two and a half miles. But I'm feeling all right for it, to be honest. Uh, I'm just keen to get my tent up, get that one drying out because of condensation last night and then we'll crash. Hi chicken! Don't peck me! <laughs> Today is just shy of 21 miles and my guidebook, rather generously I think, calls it a recovery day for we traverse the Westmoreland Plateau so it's very gently undulating and it's quite a sparse landscape but thankfully there's a few key sites along the way that will keep us entertained just going over the railway and you can see the high industrial towers of the Shap industry over there the cement works were impressive to look at and clearly important for the employment of local people. Then it was over the M6 motorway, busy with vehicles. You can see all these rocks around me. Well, this is actually a limestone pavement and we are well and truly into limestone country now. I expect we'll see a lot more today and uh, they're really quite gnarly how they've been weathered and eroded away by the weather. They just get these holes and crevices in which lichen and fungi and pioneer species actually such as hawthorn trees can grow. Um, they're really quite interesting habitats. I was now in the Yorkshire Dales National Park and this stretch in particular with its mixed match of paths was otherwise barren and featureless leaving me disorientated and confused. Okay, I'm really struggling here. This is hard and I'm really trying to just fight down panic actually. Um, there's two isolated trees there, which is what my map's saying I should be looking for. It all kind of lines up, but there's nothing around it for me to look at. To be fair, my guidebooks and OS maps didn't match up. So instead, I just trusted my instincts and eventually rejoined the trail. Sea to sea. Big isolated boulder, which actually seems smaller than I last remember. I'm back on track. That was hard. I don't know what it was that threw me. I resolved to take my time along the next stretch over Crosby Ravensworth Fell, settling back into a feeling of calm. The route dropped into a little gully, supposedly containing the grave of Robin Hood, then continued on to join a quiet road. Exciting times! I found a lime kiln! And actually it's quite amazing how much of it remains. But uh, I was just looking at it, admiring the kind of architecture that's needed for this piece of engineering. And then you turn around and face the way that we're walking and check out that incredible view. Can you imagine working here? This being your morning commute, probably up from Orton, or being the people that slept, slept here and kept an eye on things. It's not half bad.
We have arrived at Sunny Big in Tarn. And we can actually see uh, or hear the lapwings just in the distance. This is a really important kind of bird sanctuary. And there's some swans over there as well. It's kind of a real paradise. And it's nice because you just emerge from the moors to this pool of water. After many miles across Ravenstonedale Moor, where I was told by my guidebook to hug the wall, I eventually reached Several's village settlement on Scandal Beck, said to be the most important prehistoric site in Britain. Though little remains above the surface, except giant's graves, also known as pillow mounds, which some people say are the remains of prehistoric rabbit closures. We got awesome views up over nine standards, which we'll be heading for tomorrow. And uh, I can just see the railway tunnel that I'm headed for and Kirby Stephen tucked away in the valley. I think I'm definitely really looking forward to getting there now. You know, even in my dazed and dehydrated state, I must not lose sight of the beauty that's around me. It's such a contrast to the highs and lows of the Lake District, but it's still very pretty nonetheless. Finally in Kirby Stephen, I dragged my dehydrated and weary body to the campsite with only one thing on my mind. This is all I care about. Water. <coughs> Made it to Kirby Stephen. Day five, done. After a little rest, I felt revived and ventured into town, a place full of history with numerous interesting buildings. There was a temperance hall built in 1856, a hostel in a converted Methodist church complete with authentic features, numerous outdoor shops and pubs, a visitor's centre, and perhaps most notably of all, a 13th century parish church with its distinctive red sandstone, often called the Cathedral of the Dales. It's six o'clock and we're on the road. Today is 28 miles all the way from here, Kirby Stephen to Reef. We've got nine standards rig to traverse this morning, which is notoriously challenging in terms of navigation. Um, but good news is I'm feeling revived and refreshed. Heading out of town, the trail crossed over the pretty river Eden via Frank's Bridge thought to be named after Frank Birkbeck, who lived in the area in the 19th century. Check this sign out. Robin Hood's Bay, 108 miles to go. And you can see we've come 82 miles from St. Bees. That feels very rewarding to see that sign, actually. My spirit soared as the sun breached the hedges and warmed me as I walked, passing through Hartley Village and then on via a huge quarry. I think they're silhouetted on the horizon. I can just see like a few pillars sticking up and I'm wondering if that's nine standards. It's quite cool to be able to see our destination. Quite a way uphill though. <laughs> Once on Burkett Hill, I stopped at the rest of while carved wooden seat to take in the endless views behind me. And then it was on to Hartley Fell, following the red route up to the top of nine standards. Due to severe erosion of the peat, there are three colour-coded paths across the Pennines to Keld, the exact route taken dictated by the time of year or the weather that you're exploring the area. That being said, the way marking is notoriously terrible, and I was a little nervous about tackling the stretch after nine standards across the boggy landscape. Boom! Nine standards rig, 660 metres above sea level. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine little standard things. Actually, quite big standard things. And uh, wow, the views across the moors are quite something. The highest point then is actually a trig point just over there. So we'll wander over there, which the red route actually goes past anyway. And then that's where the navigational challenge begins. This here is the sort of compass dial thing on the way to the trig point. It shows all the different places that we can see 
So we've got Wensleydale is the direction that we're heading. Over there is the Northern Pennines. Over there is the Howgill Hills. And then of course over there, far, far away in the distance, is the Lake District National Park. And that is where we've come from. And it's so incredible to be able to see that distance that we've travelled by foot alone and yet we're still not even halfway on this trail. Wow. <laughs> Here we are. Boom. Look at this. Oh, it's glorious. <laughs> Slabs. Woohoo. <laughs> we will survive. I don't know how long these will carry on for, but I'm very glad that they're here. And they're going in roughly the right direction. So I'm not just like choosing a nice path and following it. I would have had to have gone through that. But thankfully, there's this precariously balanced slab to walk over. Oh, we're okay. Oh, boy. There's a flipping sign! Oh, man, I feel happier than I do at Christmas, people. Look, we've got this brand new, beautifully displayed sign saying that we need to go that way. Oh, oh and, 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 look at this! This is the split point. Cumbria is here, I'm in Cumbria, and now I'm in the county of Yorkshire. Oh, farewell Cumbria, it's been good. Oh, the rocks ended very quickly. Okay, let's do this. At the crest of White Mossy Hill, look for the pile of stones due south. If you can't see them, just head south. All right. Whoa. Now that is a view. The moors stretch out as far as I can see. Any form of rain, and this would just be saturated, and we're talking like knee deep as a minimum. Yes, yes, yes. We have made it to the pile of stones and I can see the pillar of millstones just over there, a few hundred meters away. Oh, and then once we get there, we're doing all right. But this is the glorious pile of stones that if you do this route, you will be very relieved to stumble upon. I made it to the pillar with ease and stopped to chat yeah. to the first walker I'd seen yeah. in days, feeling triumphant at having made it through the difficult navigational stretch. A little further on and I joined a clear path alongside grouse butts and a shooting lodge before reaching the famous Raven Seat Farm, known for the Yorkshire Shepherdess. The working farm was busy with machinery when I passed through but I still opted to treat myself to a homemade cream tea, said to be one of the best in the area. I just realized that was my first cup of tea on the trail. I'm normally a bit of a teapot. I just drink tea for England, just on day-to-day -day sort of existence. But uh, that was very enjoyable, I have to admit. So. We're really approaching Swaledale country now and uh, this is where the route splits again. So the original route goes high, it goes up over the moors, but uh, I'm going to head down on the alternative route through Swaledale just because we have nothing like that near us and it's just the most beautiful place in terms of just, <laughs> you just want to like give it a hug and go ah, oh, as the river like runs alongside, you've got little bridges all the hamlets, all the fields, the dry stone walls. What skill goes into dry stone walling, it's incredible. I dropped down to join the small bee road, crossing over the river Swale via a little packhorse bridge. Nearby, I found an old lime kiln, then spotted some beautiful waterfalls on the river. It seemed that around every corner, there was some historic building or beautiful natural feature to enjoy. Just on the little road down into Keld. Quite keen to check this place out actually. 
for such an isolated little hamlet, there's a lot going on. Keld once stood at the heart of the local lead mining industry during the mid-19th century, during which many remarkable, now Grade II listed buildings were built, including Congregational and Methodist chapels, the school and the literary institute, now home to the Heritage Centre, with displays of local history and farming heritage. In search of a drink, I popped into the only store in the village, which Hello. belongs to the campsite, but ended up buying something a little bit colder that suited me just fine. This is good. It's yoghurt. Very refreshing. <laughs> hey look, we're joining the Pennine Way here, and there's the uh, iconic acorn sign that is the National Trails. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, I remember this. I can't believe it's still here. Check it out. It's like an old tractor thing. <laughs> meep, meep. So this is the split then. So that route goes up to the high route and this is the low one through Swaledale. The beautiful, beautiful Swaledale. If you have any doubts about what I mean, you're gonna see very soon. We've got these ruins here, just sat underneath this rock face. It was fairly level walking alongside the river swale, and I kept my eye out for herons stalking fish in the shallows. Then it was on through countless fields, broken up by dry stone walls and slot gates, which proved to be quite difficult to get through with a giant pack. <sighs> Another one down. <laughs> You can see all the different field boundaries that I need to walk through. There's one there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and then there. <laughs> it just goes on and on. Now it's very easy to pass by all of these dry stone walls and just see them as markers of boundaries and uh, just dry stone walls. But when you actually stop and think about what they are and how they're created, it's said that a really skilled dry stone waller could only ever really put together two meters worth of length on a day's work. So can you imagine how long it would take to make all of these dry stone walls? And some of them are hundreds of years old and they're just repaired. And they're so skillfully put together in a sense that every single rock that's used has been selected for the very place that it's in. There's no mortar used, that's why they're dry stone walls. And uh, they're really very strong. But these days they are slowly being replaced for fences which are cheaper and more convenient and basically do exactly the same thing but can you imagine this place having fences around I mean you just feel like you're back home in Somerset so uh, they're what bring a lot of character up here to the north and the farming here in the north and you know they're such a sign of the history as well of this land and how it's been used so uh, there's a lot to be said for these dry stone walls and in fact uh, Apparently there's 125,000 miles worth of dry stone walls here in the UK. That's a lot of rocks. That's a lot of miles. Let's make sure we respect these walls when we walk past them. Don't climb over them. Don't pull them down. They take a long time to repair and they've probably been there a lot, lot longer than you could ever imagine. It's never a smooth act going through those things. With the skies clouding over, I made it into Gunnerside, which unsurprisingly derives its name from the Old Norse word for hill or pasture. It has a pub and a couple of cafes, one in which I stopped and devoured a bunch of sandwiches. <laughs> Lane Foot. These ruins were once two cottages with sheds, a survey carried out in 2003 concluded that one building was built in the late 17th century and another added to the west end in the mid 18th century. In 1841 these ruins housed 14 people. 
minors, their children and families. Gosh, that's a lot of people. It's quite amazing being able to look down through the valley and see every little field and boundary. It looks like something out of a storybook. Can you honestly imagine living there with that view every single day? It's just insane to be so remote. I think I'd really like that for a short period of time, but then I'd miss everybody. So if I moved out here, everyone would have to come with me. All the awesome people in my life. I wouldn't be able to survive otherwise. <laughs> How amazing is this? The sun suddenly blaring out behind us, lighting the way. In due course, I dropped down off the moors into Hilaf, then rejoined the river Swale, where I finally did see a heron. It's seven o'clock and I'm in wreath. I cannot believe we made it. And it looks beautiful. Wreath is said to be the capital of Swaledale, and at its heart lies a village green surrounded by buildings of old and new. Welcome to Orchard Caravan and Camping Park. All that's left to do is to set up and get some food in me. That was a good day. I realized last night when I was semi-conscious in my tent that I have passed halfway and I'm now 113 miles into my walk along the Coast to Coast Trail which is a very satisfying number Well I guess we are near the river but ducks? Yeah. them! Waddle waddle! <laughs> Once again I found myself walking alongside the river Swale and would stay by its side for most of the day though sometimes it would be a little distance away. A little further on and I passed by Marek Priory, once a Benedictine nunnery, now an outdoor centre. Oh, dear me. There we go. The next few miles proved to be a jumble of open fields, slot gates and little settlements with old churches, such as the church of St Edmund the Martyr, which had bottled water and snacks for sale. It seems like the sun has come out with full of vengeance for the cloud that was covering the sky this morning. It is pretty scorching. It's funny because I definitely remember this cairn being whiter five years ago and actually even in my guidebook it calls it the white cairn but uh, you can see how weathering and erosion has taken its toll all the paint's peeling off the rocks That's not a bad view Three miles to Richmond That's achievable It's quite shocking actually just how dry the ground is. I mean the grass is just parched everywhere and dying. Uh, the only thing that really seems to flourish is the bracken which isn't exactly native anyway. Richmond! That's a good sign to see. Happy days! Before I knew it, I found myself caught up in the hustle and bustle of the largest settlement on the coast to coast. There were streets lined with gift shops and cafes, and a welcoming atmosphere that made me smile. In the market square stood an obelisk, erected in 1788 to replace a medieval market cross. I popped into the Green Howards Museum in the former Holy Trinity Church to find out more about the town's regiment, but in the end I could resist it no longer. I just had to go and visit one of my all-time favourite archaeological sites, the castle. We have arrived at the castle. 
going through the gate here, completely stoked. <laughs> Originally called Ritchie Mount, meaning the strong hill, the castle was constructed from 1071 onwards, following the Norman conquest of England. The main entrance of the castle is surrounded by a curtain wall, which the main medieval domestic buildings would have stood against. For me though, I was keen to explore the remains of the keep, rising to just over 30 metres tall. It gives the impression of solidity and strength. This here then is the Great Hall and it was built in 1171, actually a hundred years after the main parts of the castle was built. Now you can hear from my voice how it's echoing and carrying up into the ceiling. You can just imagine what kind of place this would be with long tables laid out, people dining on either side on the finest foods in the land. The atmosphere that would have been in here as their voices carried around, you'd have jesters singing and you'd have lots of musicians dancing around. This would have been a real hub of a place. Moving up more time-worn stairs and through various rooms, I made my way to the top of the keep, topped by four square turrets. I have made it to the top of the keep and not surprisingly there are incredible views over the surrounding landscape. I can see right across the Vale of York to the North York Moors and of course here in the foreground I can just keep an eye on what's going on in Richmond. This really is a great vantage point to keep an eye on the people and the surrounding area. Gosh this is a squeeze. Not sure where I'm going. <laughs> I had an absolute blast exploring the hidden passageways and winding stairwells across the castle ruins, losing myself in my imagination, wondering what life would have been like within the castle walls all those years ago. Here's the bridge, so we'll cross over this, leaving Richmond behind, and we're going to head left along the river for a little bit and it's quite cool because just over there you can see the edge of the castle that was great fun visiting there This is exciting, walking through a field of wheat or barley or something. Do look like a farmer. It's nice though. Ta-da! It's quite cool actually because in this area we've got these coast to coast signs which are just helpful knowing that you're going through the right gates. Here we are then, this is Colburn. It's kind of just a series of very big houses off of their own private lanes. But uh, this is where I was originally going to stay, at the pub. But today I have decided I'm going to walk on a little bit further to a different campsite. I was just walking along and I was like, something feels really weird. And I've realised it's this. This is a hedge. Do you realise this is not a dry stone wall? It just feels a bit bizarre after all of those miles of rocks to have plants forming a boundary. <laughs> I had called ahead to St Giles Farm and discovered that I could camp in their well-tended garden. I was greeted like family and instantly felt at home in the beautiful surroundings. Definitely made the right choice coming here. Homemade cake and tea. Mm. It has definitely been a good day. <laughs> so I'm uh, on my way now to Ingleby Cross, which is where I'm headed for today. Just crossing the road to get to the bridge to cross over the River Swale, which we're still following.
just got a little diversion around this quarry, but check this out. This was a sand and gravel quarry owned by Tarmac, which extracts, processes and sells around 450,000 tonnes of sand and gravel each year. In recent years, disused areas of the quarry have been restored and landscaped to support a wealth of wildlife and is used and enjoyed by many local people. This is a very pretty place, Bolton on Swale. And actually my guidebook says about the church that I think might just be worth checking out. In the middle of the village was a preserved village water pump. And then it was onto St Mary's Church, with the present building being built in the early 14th century on the site of previous Norman and Saxon buildings. I stopped to use their donation-based refreshment service and cool off in the shade. Ah, oh, that was lovely. So I popped into the church, had a cup of tea, gave them a donation, and uh, had a chat with a lady who was cleaning there as well, which was just as refreshing as the tea, to be honest. Through fields I travelled, past horses and cattle, and alongside trickling streams, with crops nearby whispering in the gentle breeze. The path often followed empty countryside roads, which proved to allow for much faster progress than walking cross-country, which was often overgrown, with ill-kept styles presenting hazardous boundary crossings. It was tough walking in the heat, and my legs begged for a change in gradient that never seemed to come. Ah, oh, no one uses this, do they? <sighs> Help! <laughs> Thankfully back on the road, Although not thankfully because it's even hotter. I think that's my issue today. I think it's just the heat. There is such a slight breeze. It's pretty much non-existent. And it's just sapping my energy. Danby Whisk. Happy days. Let's find this pub and get some water. Hopefully that will revive me. That's a shame. Turns out I've arrived in a, an hour, in an hour's time there'll be some kind of cream tea fate thing on the green there and the pub is shut so I haven't been able to get any water there but thankfully a lovely lady's just gone to fill up my water bottles so I'm very happy about that because that will mean I will survive the next stretch. <laughs> Near the trains! That's the main London to Edinburgh line. <laughs> the road is just starting to melt again. You can see where, well, I can feel how it's sticky. There's such mixed uh, opinions on stuff today, just because, like, one minute I don't want to be on the road, the next I do want to be on the road. I think it depends on the quality of the fields and stuff we're walking through and the styles of course. Oh it's a hard life this walking business. Tired travellers, tuck shop ahead. This is looking hopeful. I think it might be an honesty box. I love people that leave honesty boxes. Please put donations in the box, thanks. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> this is on top of it. Oh, ice lollies. There's ice lollies. <gasps> right. This person is a complete legend. <sighs> now for me, this is what backpacking is about. Stumbling upon random generous people that give like this. It just makes my day every time. Hey! <laughs> oh, 
that was very satisfying. The miles slowly added up as the day wore on, and eventually I found myself crossing the A19 before one final push down into Ingleby Arncliffe and Ingleby Cross. Ah, look at that! I couldn't have timed it any better. Woo! <laughs> Final stretch then down to the Blue Belt Inn. Very relieved to be here. I feel like every day actually has been a solid day on this trail because I just rock up at the place where I'm camping like satisfied that <laughs> I have arrived. And uh, today is no different. So we'll just uh, find the place, pitch up, pay some money, eat, sleep and do it all again tomorrow. That is the plan. Despite their proximity to the A road, the Inglebys turned out to be peaceful places. It's said the Ingleby Cross was named after the war memorial that sits in the centre. After a quick look around, I headed to the Bluebell Inn, where for £10 I could pitch up round the back for the night. It seemed pricey to me, and I didn't receive a very warm welcome, but needs must. Once things quietened down, I got cosy, hoping for a good night's sleep. It is a new day and I'm very ready to embrace it. I didn't sleep so well again unfortunately so I'm still struggling with the fatigue but today we're up onto the North York Moors. There'll be lots of heather, there'll be lots of views, there'll be lots of climbs. I am looking forward to it. So I'm just going to finish sorting myself up here. I'm not rushing even though I've got quite a long day today. It's 21 miles all the way to Blakely Ridge so the Lion Inn. Literally that's it. It's just an inn on a ridge in the middle of the moors. So I'll be camping there. So we've got this sign here, basically we're showing, or following even, the Cleveland Way now. So four coast to coast east, follow Cleveland Way signs, basically that way or that way. Well, obviously one of the ways, I haven't checked the map yet. So, um, But uh, you saw the iconic acorn there, white acorn, black background, that's the National Trail sign. And uh, I believe there's 16 National Trails now and they're trail, trails of all different lengths across all different parts of the country and they're designated for all different reasons, whether it's the archaeological significance, the geological, geographical, the culture, uh, whatever it may be, every single one's unique. And it's quite special actually just to be able to join the Cleveland Way for a little bit. But uh, also being up here at this vantage point, I can just see the vast flatness that I've walked through, kind of a jumble of fields that are ploughed and farmed and woodlands and settlements, but it is just painfully flat. Check it out, bilberries, wild form of blueberries, growing everywhere around here. Oh man, happy days. Look at them, woohoo. Now this might just be a handful of bilberries, but to me, this is what life is about. In fact, this is what makes life, life. You know, this is what gets me out of bed in the morning, is finding the little things that uh, give me such joy. And this bilberry bush, or these bushes, just make me very, very happy indeed. And the taste of these is just heavenly. Hand-picked by me, completely fresh, right here, available for anyone. This is what life's about. The simple things that make it extraordinary. Okie dokie, so we're officially come out of the woods. That's enough climbing for now, I think. And uh, we're just walking across this beautiful stretch of the Cleveland Hills. And we can see all the heather around us. I think it looks like ling heather, but the flowers aren't actually out yet. A bit later in the season. Um, and I bumped into Anne on the trail. Uh, she's walking the Cleveland Way. So that's the trail that we picked up a bit earlier. And uh, she's, how many days are you doing in? 10. 10 days. It's going to be awesome. Um, so yeah, she's putting me to shame with all her walking stories of all the different... <laughs> Trails and things that she's done, and uh, what you've got an Instagram account, is that right? Yeah. yeah. What's the name of it? Thistle Dragon. Thistle Dragon. So definitely check that out if you want some serious walking inspiration, as opposed to my little <laughs> holiday thing. <laughs> Extreme fire risk. Everywhere is very, very dry. No smoking, barbecues, or stoves. We're all right then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
when there's no footpath, people end up tramping. Oh, old wagon. That's quite cool. What does it say? Oh, erosion control. <laughs> That's not as exciting as I don't. <laughs> okay. We could, we could, yeah, exactly. We could make up like some epic story about why this wagon's here, but the truth is, we don't know. It's just there. <laughs> the undulating nature of the day's walk ahead quickly became apparent, and my legs relished the challenge as we climbed up onto the walls. We're just approaching a cairn, and my guidebook's been really helpful in pointing out that this is not just any old cairn. This actually marks the site of a Bronze Age burial mound. So around 2000 years ago, it was built here. And you can see from the location how far we can see with the views. This is a very prominent point in the landscape. It probably marks a burial mound of someone quite important within the society at that time. And uh, oh, here we go, look, there's even a plaque. The mound opposite. This sign is a Bronze Age burial mound or round barrow, which dates from around 2000 BC. It's protected in law as a scheduled monument. Please do not disturb the site or add any stones to it. So there we go. Tell you what, it's not a bad place to be buried. A. Hey. <laughs> We've got some heather here. This is bell heather, so it started to flower. You can see the flowers are shaped like, shaped like bells, believe it or not. And then around it, this stuff here is ling heather. So the flowers grow up the stem. But uh, you can just imagine how beautiful this whole area would be, just draped in a layer of purple and pink. It's a bit brown and green today, but uh, this kind of brings your imagination to life, this little patch here. It's really lovely to see. We've been climbing for a fair while now and uh, we're just approaching one of the high points for today. 408 meters above sea level. We've got a couple of trig points on the top. From the trig point and boundary marker, there were great views over towards Middlesbrough. And despite the haze, I was pretty sure we could just about see the North Sea. Hiya. Hiya. Oh. Hiya there. Yeah. We went up. We've arrived at Lordstone, so this is about three miles away from the halfway point for today at Claybank Top, or, well, that's just over halfway. So we're nearly halfway, basically. And uh, I didn't even see this on my map when I was prepping last night. But basically, check it out. It's like a little cafe place. You can camp here. There's food and drink. And uh, just a nice hub in the middle of the moors. Ready? Yeah. Onwards. <laughs> We're fueled with our tea. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Social awareness is <laughs> Back on the trail, mm. we passed a little memorial yeah. plaque dedicated to Richard, who created the Samaritan Way, a 40 mile route that runs across the North York Moors. And then we headed onwards and upwards. We're approaching the top of this climb out of Lordstones. And, uh, We've got the Alec Falconer seat here, memorial seat. Ah, there we go. Look at that view. There we go. 1884 to 1968. That is the most rewarding view. Could not be happier about that. Loads more bilberries. Just gonna eat all these. <sighs> That's what life's about. Simple things. Exactly. Apart from this hill. That's not a simple thing. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Alright, we made it to the top of this one. The next one, we can see some rocks called the Wayne Stones, which are a big jumble of outcrop, basically, that we'll work our way through. It's thought that the Wayne Stones derived their name from a Saxon word meaning to grieve or lament. 
Perhaps then, we wondered, they were a place where people came to mourn for the dead. Regardless, the stones made for an interesting place to explore. Before long, we found ourselves crossing a small road and then heading up to the top of Claybank Top, the last major climb for the day. From the crest of the hill, there were fantastic views back over the Cleveland Hills that we traversed earlier in the day. It was a rewarding sight, but even better was spotting some red grouse in the heather, their mottled feathers blending in perfectly with their surroundings. Ah. Oh. Look at that. Here we are then. 454 metres above sea level. It was our highest trig point for today. Very satisfying to be up here since the sun has come out. Woo! <laughs> and it's now very warm, <laughs> actually. <laughs> One extreme to another. We now found ourselves crossing our remore along a wide open track. Interesting features along the way included a number of boundary markers one with a face, and the other with the initials KJ inscribed on it. We're very much approaching the disused railway line that was the Rosedale Railway that used to serve the sort of iron mines around here. And you can just see, it's just a big scar in the landscape, this long line of track. This is the disused railway line. See what I mean by a straight line? <laughs> Are these the... You can see like the shading, is that where the sleepers were? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's like scarred the landscape. Yeah. Leave them away. Go I go that way. And you go that way. Yeah, that way. Into the extreme fire risk area. Yeah. I'm into the extreme risk. Aww. Yeah, See ya. Yeah, that's it. Bye. <laughs> And that's it. We're alone on the moors again. That was really fun. We've got awesome views here to my right over the Farndale Valley. It just looks really lovely actually, although the clouds are coming in again, so the colour is being sucked out of the landscape. Starting to feel quite weary now, but thankfully we've got our first views over towards the inn on the ridge there. You know, I'm feeling fatigued, but it's been a good day and it's nice to finish tired because then you finish satisfied. And that's it. Once I'm at the inn, Two days left on the trail. That is astonishing. The Lion Inn is a 16th century freehouse standing at 1,325 feet above sea level. Inside, it's a worldly place full of character with dark, time worn beams and real open fires. A great place to relax at the end of a long day on the trail. I was told to pitch up round the back alongside a handful of other tents and settled in to what turned out to be quite an interesting evening. What? This is the true nature of this landscape. Pretty much a whiteout. I think I've got about 20 meters visibility. But uh, today is the penultimate day. What a way to start! <laughs> this here is Fat Betty. It's actually just slightly off route. And uh, there's a tradition here where people take a piece of food that's left here and then leave a piece of food. But unfortunately someone scoffed it all so there's nothing for me to exchange. But uh, it's quite an unusual shaped monument just out here in the moors.
I just noticed this stick. Have a look at this. It's stuck in the road itself. All of this has clearly melted over the last few hot days that we've had. It's really quite astonishing how all of the roads have been melting in the Lake District. My feet were getting stuck and uh, quite a contrast to the weather we've got right now. After many miles of misty track walking, the route suddenly dropped down off the moors into Glazedale, where it passed by the Robinson Institute, built in 1911, and the famed Beggar Bridge, built by Thomas Ferris in the 17th century, so that young lovers in the neighbourhood would not be separated should the river be swollen by heavy rains. Taking a slight diversion, apparently there's some stepping stones down here, so I'd like to have a look at them. Upon crossing the stones, I found myself in Egton Bridge, with a fine collection of grand houses and the Catholic St Hedda's Church, which contains relics from Father Nicholas Postgate, who was born in the hamlet and executed in 1679 for following his faith. Just thought I'd check out this end of town. There's supposed to be a pub that's good for drinks, so I thought I'd just have a look here. There's just one and a half miles to go until we hit Gromont and uh, I've obviously left the pub behind, very revived by that cup of tea. It wasn't the cheapest but it certainly was a good decision. And uh, to my right I've just finished passing the Egton Estate. It looks very fancy, kind of shaded away in the trees and like any estate these days they've got llamas. <laughs> Seems to be the in thing at the moment to have llamas in your estate. And uh, the big straight road or track even that I'm following right now this is actually an old toll road between Egton and Gromont and halfway along we should pass the old toll house and I believe they've still got the original prices of the toll road hanging out outside so quite excited to have a look at that, see if we can afford to pass through. A toll collector would have lived in the house and charged passers-by for using the road, likely during the 18th and 19th centuries. For me though, the track made for easy walking and I enjoyed spotting different wildflowers in the verges and soaking up the comforting sound of the River Esk flowing alongside. Over the bridge we go, into Gromont. Now I've heard quite a few people say they're not such a fan of Gromont, but I really like it. It's literally just one strip of road with houses and stuff either side but you know like so many of these places it's got a lot of history built up around the iron stone smelting and now it's not only got an actual railway that's functional but also the heritage railway that goes all the way across to Whitby the steam railway and uh, hopefully we'll be able to catch sight of one of the trains today. I made my way straight to the well-kept station part of the North York Moors Heritage Railway line, which featured as the Hogwarts Express in the original Harry Potter movie. The railway now carries more passengers than any other heritage railway in the UK. It was definitely worth hanging about to see a train pull in, watching the conductors and drivers all dressed in period clothing. I felt transported back to the 1800s when the line first opened as the Whitby to Pickering Railway. It was great fun watching the steam engine come in. I've just found this little footpath that goes to the engine sheds, I believe. So we'll go and check that out, and then we'll push on for the final four miles onto Little Beck, which is where I've decided I'm going to stay tonight. The engine sheds house a number of steam trains and a little museum dedicated to the history of the railway. Soon, though, I was back on the trail, tackling the steep climb out of Gromont, moving quickly and feeling strong. We're getting there, feeling remarkably good actually. Stopping in Gromont waiting for the train has obviously worked miracles. Two miles to Little Beck. Whoop whoop. 
across the moors. Yes, we finally got views over Whitby, just about. <laughs> right over there, we can see the sea, you can see the abbey, sort of, right on the hill, on the cliffs there. Ah, oh, you can only imagine what that would be like on a clear day, but that's a really good feeling to see that. We're so nearly there, folks. It's amazing, it's just amazing. After a short stretch along an A road, I picked up a path across the open moors. It was still quite early in the afternoon, and I felt remarkably good physically, but mentally, I suddenly felt fragile. Earlier in the day, it had crossed my mind that I could push on all the way to Robin Hood's Bay and the end of the trail, and I felt excited by the possibility of a challenge. But at the same time, I knew this would be unwise, and leave me feeling unsatisfied and separate from the lessons I'd learnt on the trail. Yet despite shutting this down, it left behind a residue of doubt and uncertainty that tipped me into an unstable place. Perhaps what I was feeling was fear of the trail ending. I wasn't sure, but I wanted my joy back. I pressed on to Intake Farm, where I was due to camp for the night, taking the time to focus on my breath and let out some emotion. Thankfully, a good cry made some space for perspective, and I comforted myself in my humanity, whilst releasing myself from all the nagging pressures and insecurities that I'd carried with me so far on the trail. I really need to try and find some peace so that tomorrow I can just enjoy the last day, take my time, not rush, and finish when I finish, feeling well within my mind and my body. So, I will breathe, I will be thankful for today, I will get my tent up, I will get some sleep, and tomorrow we will finish the coast to coast. Today is the day. There is just 12 miles to go to Robin Hood's Bay and I'm quite excited about the walk that we've got for the next four to five hours. We've got woodlands, we've got waterfalls, we've got moorland walking and of course we're going to hit the coast. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to this last day. We're just going to amble along and enjoy it every step, treasure these moments, reflect on everything that we've come through to get to this point and uh, finish feeling on a high. I found it hard to believe that between the 17th and 19th centuries, the hamlet was actually the centre for alum mining in the area, used for dyeing as well as tanning leather. It was also home to a 20th century master woodcarver who exclusively used English oak. I walked past his house, wondering what stories the buildings could tell. Common animals in Little Beckwood nature is there. Dippers, you see them on the water. Red emerald butterflies, beautiful. Speckled wood butterfly, ooh, roe deer. Tree creepers, badgers, nuthatch, primroses, they'll probably be over now though. There's loads of wildlife in this place. It's really wonderful actually how just by conserving little areas of woodland like this, specifically for wildlife, they just flourish with species interdependent of each other. It's such a pleasure to be able to come here and uh, see what we can see so we'll keep our eyes and ears sharp as we walk through. Old alum works. Look at this. <laughs> That's quite cool. You can't really get into it though. Never mind. Got this little hideaway thing here, carved into the rock. It's a bit dark inside. Woo. Random. I'm just approaching Falling Foss, a 20 metre high waterfall. It's taken me a fair while to get here. I found navigating through these woods very challenging, but I can just see it around the corner. Wow. The falls tumbled gently down into a dark pool below, and I stood there for a while, mesmerised by the sound, certain that in winter there would be an even greater force. Nearby was the Midge Hall, once a gatekeeper's cottage, now the Falling Foss Tea Garden.
leaving the woods behind, we're heading up to Sneeton Low Moor now. Looking back over the forest proved to be rewarding, but once on the moor, my appreciation turned to the splashes of purple around me, heather that was just coming into flower. You can see the sea stretching off in front of me, and to my right, the anticipation builds. I'll be so stoked to hit the coast. The trail was well marked across Greystone Hill Moor, and then dropped down into High Horsker, the last village before hitting the coast. There's such a small place, it's actually quite busy here. I've been sat here for a while just like finishing off my cereal bars. There's no point carrying them now. It's funny because there's a road sign there that says two and a half miles to go to Robin Hood's Bay. It's a little bit further for us. There's this well here, 1790, just tucked away on the side of this busy road. I just love stumbling upon things like this that you would not otherwise notice. Like even cycling, you'd go too fast past that to see it. But walking is slow enough to notice most things. It really does feel fantastic to be walking up to the sea again. I really missed it. And this time, it's the North Sea. Three and a half miles to go. That's amazing. And just like that, we're up on the cliffs. Wow, this is the most incredible feeling. I have literally no words. What's actually even more incredible is that we've also rejoined the Cleveland Way that we left a couple of days ago by Claybank Top. So it's really nice to be on another trail, an actual national trail. And hopefully that means the signposting will be simple. I can just relax into these last few miles and make my way on to Robin Hood's Bay. The cliffs in front of me were an impressive sight, towering high over weathered beaches, being pummeled ceaselessly by wind-driven waves. I strode confidently along the tops of the cliffs, in pace with the familiar sounds of the coast that stirred my senses. And then I saw it. You can see Robin Hood's Bay just over there. That's our first views. It's getting closer with every step. little haphazardous, with rows of stone cottages and independent shops lining the steep cliff face, but it had a warm and friendly atmosphere that drew me in. I followed the main road down towards the slipway at the base of the village, where the trail officially ends, my heart in my mouth. I couldn't help but smile, knowing what I was about to achieve. Well, here we are then. This is the North Sea and I am at Robin Hood's Bay. 11 days ago we left St Bees and here we are, having travelled across mountains and moors, through meadows and forests, <laughs> along rivers and who knows however many miles of dry stone walls. But we are here, 200 miles later, at the North Sea. There are no words to describe how ecstatic and amazing I'm feeling right now. But I don't quite feel like the journey's ended just because for me backpacking is kind of a way of life and already my head's already going on to the next adventure and the next challenge but I can say one thing for sure the coast to coast has taught me a huge amount about myself and about the beauty of our country I've travelled through the Lake District National Park the Yorkshire Dales and I'm here now in the North York Moors some of the most stunning national parks that this country has to offer and I feel so privileged to have been able to experience everything that I've experienced, the sunrises, the sunsets, the sun, the wind, the rain, we've had it all. I've used every piece of kit that I've carried with me and I feel on top of the world. Thank you for following my journey. And I really hope this inspires you to get out and do your own challenge. Maybe walk the coast to coast, maybe a different trail, but whatever you do, make sure you embrace the journey. After dipping my boots in closure, 
I threw back the pebble that I picked up at St Bees and carried with me across the country. It was an emotional moment that symbolised so much, and I knew that I would draw strength from the experience for years to come, holding my journey along the coast to coast, forever close to my heart.